Welcome to our first of three lectures on the basics of hypothesis testing. This is a 32 minute lecture, so sit back and relax. There is very little in assumed knowledge, except that you've watched our 10 minute introductory lecture to hypothesis testing on YouTube. If not, please watch this clip. It's silly, funny, yet informative. The link to the clip is here. Secondly, this lecture assumes that you have a basic understanding of the normal distribution and why it is used in probability theory. This will allow you to have a deeper understanding of today's material. However, if these concepts are still new to you, you can still get by without them. Okay, let's jump into the fun stuff. First, some housekeeping. When I say mean, I'm talking about the average. In statistics, mean and average refer to the same thing. Alrighty, with that out of the way, let's move on. In statistics, the population contains every single observation that exists in the world. Now, suppose we're interested in the population mean. We denote the population mean by mu, which sort of looks like a u. Imagine that you conduct a study on the average height of males. That is, you ask the question, what is the average height of males? Almost all the time, we cannot observe the entire population, as it's too large. For example, it'd be too costly and too time-consuming for us to measure the height of every single male out there in the world and calculate the population average height. As such, the population average is usually unobservable. So how can we find out more about the population average height of males? Well, it's quite simple. We can take a random sample from the population and calculate the sample average. The sample average is usually represented by an x with a hat. Now, if we use a large enough sample, and if it is indeed random, then our sample average of male heights should be a good estimate of the population average. This idea is vital to hypothesis testing, so let's walk through this concept one more time. Suppose someone claims that the true average height of males is equal to 175 centimeters. This is a population average, which we cannot observe. Remember, the population of males on Earth is very big, too big for us to calculate the average. So how can we test whether this claim is correct? Well, we can take a random sample of 50 males, and suppose we calculate the sample average height to be 176 centimeters. Now, notice that the sample average, 176, is very close to the claimed population average of 175. So this provides us with evidence that the population average is likely to be equal to 175 centimeters. Note that the sample average does not have to exactly equal the population average, as there is always going to be some sampling variation in the sample mean, because we used a random sample. But the sample mean should be close to the population mean most of the time. Now, suppose after sampling 50 males, we instead calculate the sample average height to be 182 centimeters. Since the sample average should be close to the population average, then the sample average height of 182 centimeters suggests that the population average is unlikely to be equal to 175 centimeters. So in this case, there is evidence against the claim. This is the underlying concept of hypothesis testing. There is a suggested claim about the population average. Since we can't observe the population average directly, we must use a random sample. We then calculate the sample mean and compare this to the claimed population mean. Now, recall from the 10 minute YouTube clip that your friend Sam claimed that his bowling average is 150 or higher. You decide to play three games with him and his average for those three games is a dismal 40. Now, Sam's claim of having an average of 150 or higher is sounding shady. Also, recall that your cutoff score for determining whether Sam's claim is a lie or not is 120. That is, if his average score when bowling with you is above 120, you'll believe his claim. If it is below 120, you'll conclude he is a liar. Now, probably the most important step in hypothesis testing is correctly setting up your hypotheses. This is one of the most common mistakes I see when grading exam papers, and if you get this step wrong, all your subsequent calculations and the conclusion of your test will likely be incorrect. So please pay attention. Okay, there are two possible scenarios here. Sam is either lying or he's telling the truth. So we're essentially testing two claims. One, Sam's lying and his bowling average is below 150. Or two, Sam is telling the truth and his bowling average is equal or above 150. 
Now, let's write down these claims formally. The first one is that Sam's true bowling average is below 150. The second claim is that Sam's true bowling average is 150 or above. Mu, which looks like a U, represents the population mean or population average. This is the true average that we cannot observe. That is, we will never really know Sam's true bowling average because we haven't seen every single game of bowling he's played in his entire life. So we have our two claims. Now, the claim with the equal sign will be called the null hypothesis. The other claim without the equal sign is called the alternate hypothesis. Pretty easy so far, yeah? The convention in statistics is to set up the two hypotheses as follows. First, we write down H0. This is a symbol for the null hypothesis. Now, below that, we write down H1. This is the alternate hypothesis. Make sure you write down the null and alternate hypotheses in this order. The null first and the alternate below it. Now, simply insert the null hypothesis, the claim with the equal sign next to H0. And the alternate hypothesis, the one without the equal sign next to H1. And that's all there is to correctly setting up the hypotheses. It's always this easy, as long as you follow these simple rules. Always write H0 and H1, and make sure H0 is on top of H1. H0 is a claim with the equal sign, that is, the null hypothesis. H1 is the other claim, that is, the claim without the equal sign, otherwise known as the alternate hypothesis. Surprisingly straightforward, huh? Okay, let's go through some examples for practice. Suppose Mike claims that the average price for houses in Castle Hill is more than $500,000. Write down the null and alternate hypotheses. Now, let's write down the claims. Mike states that the average house price, mu, is more than $500,000. Note that his claim is that it's more than, not more than or equal to. The counterclaim, that is the complete opposite of this, is that mu is less than or equal to $500,000. Now, here is the equal sign, so this claim must be the null hypothesis. Remember, the null hypothesis is a claim with the equal sign. The first claim has no equal sign, so this must be the alternate hypothesis. Now, let's set this up properly. We write down H0 and H1, and the null and alternate hypotheses in that order. Okay, let's look at another example. Someone claims that the average age of YouTube users is 25. Write down the null and alternate hypotheses needed to test this claim. Well, first, we write down the claim that is being made. The average age of YouTube users is equal to 25. Now, we write down the counterclaim, or the opposite of that. The average age is not equal to 25. We can see the equal sign is in the first statement, so this must be the null hypothesis. The second statement has the unequal sign, so this must be the alternate hypothesis. Now that we've figured out what's what, we simply have to write these down in the proper format. H0 for the null hypothesis, and H1 for the alternate hypothesis. The hypotheses we've just set out may look slightly different from the ones in your course or textbook. This is because it is common in statistics to replace the less than or equal to and the more than or equal to signs with an equal sign. For example, suppose your hypotheses look like this. The null hypothesis is that the population average is larger than or equal to 150, and the alternate hypothesis is that the average is less than 150. We can replace the larger than or equal to sign in the null hypothesis with an equal sign. Both null hypotheses are correct. Suppose you have another set of hypotheses. Again, we can replace the less than or equal to in the null hypothesis with an equal sign. It's best to use a convention that your teacher or textbook prefers, though technically both methods are correct. What is the burden of proof? This concept is similar to that in most modern legal systems. The defendant is assumed innocent until proven guilty. In statistics, we use a similar concept. The null hypothesis is assumed true until proven otherwise. This means that only until we gather sufficient evidence to support the alternate hypotheses, we will assume the null hypothesis holds true. Think of our bowling example. We gave Sam the benefit of the doubt that his bowling average is 150 until proven otherwise, 
That is, until we see him bowl an average of 40 over our three games with him. That's when he raised our suspicions. Alright, time to learn some jargon. Suppose we have the following null and alternate hypotheses. If there is a less than sign in the alternate hypothesis, then this is known as a lower tailed test. Think of less than meaning lower. What is known as an upper tailed test looks like this. How we can identify this as an upper tailed test is by the larger than sign in the alternate hypothesis. So if the alternate hypothesis contains a larger than sign, then you are conducting an upper tailed test. The last type of test is known as a two tailed test. Suppose we have the following hypotheses. If the alternate hypothesis has a not equal sign, then you are conducting a two tailed test. Okay, so the rule is, if the alternate hypothesis contains a not equal sign, then you are conducting a two tailed test. The reason we're naming these tests, lower tailed, upper tailed and two tailed, will become apparent shortly. Are you still with me? Okay, time to get into the guts of hypothesis testing. We're now going to talk about the rejection region, which will tell us exactly how to reject or not reject a claim, so it's vitally important. First things first, recall that the null hypothesis is assumed true until proven otherwise. So this begs the question, how do we prove that the null hypothesis is not true? That is, how do we reject the null hypothesis? The key here is to look at what type of test you're conducting, whether it is a lower tailed test, upper tailed test or a two tailed test. Before we move forward, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So without further ado, let me recap the normal distribution for you. On the x axis, we have the values of the variable of interest. This could be time, money, bowling scores, etc. The values on the x axis increase from left to right. Now, the y-axis represents the frequency of those values on the x-axis. That is, how often are these values likely to occur? An important characteristic of the normal distribution is that it is symmetrical around the mean. So the mean, or average, corresponds to the highest point of the distribution. We can see that the mean and those values around the mean have the highest frequencies. So if we're sampling randomly, we're very likely to observe values that are close to the average, mu. Now, if we look at the values that are far from the average, they correspond to low frequencies. What this means is that if sampling randomly, we're very unlikely to observe values that are substantially higher or lower than the average. Basically, we expect to see values close to the average most of the times. We can observe values that are far from the average, but this occurs rarely. From the bowling example, the distribution of possible sample means looks like this. For now, we will assume the sample averages follow a normal distribution. We do this based on the central limit theorem. I'll talk more about this in the next lecture. Okay, so what I mean by the distribution of sample means is that when we go bowling with Sam, the possibilities of his bowling scores should look like this distribution. Now, recall that we assume this claim is true until proven otherwise. So assuming his average is 150, the mean of this distribution is 150 for now. As we've already figured out, the hypotheses in this example looks like this. Okay, if Sam claims that his bowling average is 150 or higher, how can we disprove this claim? That is, when will we begin to doubt Sam's claim? Well, if we play three games of bowling with him, and his average for those three games is substantially lower than 150, then this may be evidence that this claim of a long-term bowling average of 150 is indeed false. That is, it is evidence that the null hypothesis may not be true. We call this region where we begin to doubt the null hypothesis the rejection region. What this means is that for sample averages that fall within this region, we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Recall from our 10 minute introductory lecture that we used a cutoff value, otherwise known as a critical value, of 120. That is, if Sam's bowling average for the three games we play with him is below 120, we reject his claim. If his sample bowling average with us is above 120, we will not reject his claim. Now, see how this is a lower tail test. This means that the rejection region in the normal distribution is on the left hand side of the distribution, which is a lower tail of the distribution. That's why it's called a lower tail test. So in summary, 
we assume the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. The rejection region is the area underneath the curve that tells us when we have enough evidence to reject this assumption. OK, let's look at Mike's claim that the average house price in Castle Hill is above $500,000. Now, we've already figured out the null and alternate hypotheses. Let's see how the rejection region looks like. Again, we have the normal distribution, and the mean is equal to $500,000. Remember, the null hypothesis is assumed true until proven otherwise. Now, if the null hypothesis is that the population average of house prices is equal to $500,000 or less, then the only way we can disprove this is by observing a sample average of house prices that is substantially above $500,000. So the rejection region is up here. This means that once we observe a sample average of house prices that is within this rejection region, then we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the average house price is above $500,000. Again, we may have a cutoff value, or critical value, equal to $550,000. So if we observe the sample average of house prices to be above $550,000, we will conclude that the null hypothesis is wrong and that the true population average is indeed above $500,000. Now, here's a hint as to where the rejection region should be. If you're dealing with an upper tail test, then the rejection region is on the right-hand side of the distribution, or the upper side of the distribution. How about the last example, where someone made the claim that the average age of YouTube users is 25 years. We've already figured out the null and alternate hypotheses, and they look like this. Again, we first look at the distribution of sample average ages, and similarly, the null hypothesis is assumed true until proven otherwise. So we assume the true population average age is indeed 25 years. Now, how can we disprove this assumption that the average age is 25? Well, if we find a sample average that is substantially above 25, then this may be evidence that the null hypothesis is incorrect. But because the null hypothesis is that the population average is exactly equal to 25, then there is also another way we can reject this assumption. If we find a sample average age that is way below 25, then this is also evidence that the null hypothesis may be incorrect. So you can see that we now have two rejection regions. That is, there are two ways we can reject the null hypothesis. That is, if we observe values that are substantially higher or substantially lower than 25. This is quite intuitive, yeah? So as an example, the upper critical value may be 27, and the lower critical value may be 23. So if we calculate a sample average that is between 23 and 27, we will assume the null hypothesis is correct. That is, the true average age of YouTube users is indeed 25. But if, our, but if our sample average is below 23 or above 27, then we will reject the null hypothesis. Recall that this is a two-tailed test because there is a not equal to sign in the alternate hypothesis. This tells us that there are two rejection regions at both tails of the distribution, and that's why this is known as a two-tailed test. Okay, let's recap what we've just learned. If it's a lower tail test, and we know this because there is a less than sign in the alternate hypothesis, then the rejection region is on the left hand side of the distribution, or the lower side of the distribution. If it's an upper tail test, with a larger than sign in the alternate hypothesis, then the rejection region is on the right side of the distribution, or the upper side of the distribution. Pretty straightforward so far, huh? If it seems daunting at the moment, don't worry too much just yet. We'll be working through some questions in detail. It really just takes practice. When I first learnt this stuff at uni, I spent one whole weekend going through all the textbook questions on hypothesis testing, and it all came together after practice. And yes, I'm a nerd, but you knew that already. Finally, if it's a two-tailed test, and we know this by observing a not equal sign in the alternate hypothesis, then the rejection region is on both sides of the distribution. This is because there are two ways of rejecting the null hypothesis, if the sample mean is too much higher or too much lower than the hypothesized mean. In life, anything is possible. For example, Sam's true bowling average could actually be 150, despite the fact that he bowled an average of 40 when playing with you. Perhaps Sam has a crush on you and couldn't concentrate on his game. Who knows? So, we're now going to talk about possible errors in our conclusions when conducting the test. The first type of error is called a type 1 error. 
A type 1 error occurs when the null hypothesis is rejected when it is, in fact, true. Another type of error is called a type 2 error. A type 2 error occurs when the null hypothesis is not rejected when it is, in fact, untrue. Perhaps this may help. Alright, let's begin with a type 1 error. The probability of committing a type 1 error is actually determined by the researcher. It represents how sure we want to be when rejecting the null hypothesis. Do we want the probability of a type 1 error to be 10, 5 or 1 percent? That is, when rejecting the null hypothesis, do we need to be sure, really sure or super duper sure that we're making the right decision? There's always a chance we may be wrong, so the best we can do is to manage that chance. Now how do we do that? we can adjust the size of the rejection region. So, for example, if we don't really mind committing a type 1 error with Sam, that is, calling him a lie when he's in fact telling the truth, perhaps you never really liked him anyway. Your rejection region may look like this. Perhaps it takes up the bottom 10% of the distribution. Now, suppose you would feel guilty if you accuse Sam of being a liar when in fact he's telling the truth. Perhaps Sam's actually a pretty good mate. So you might use a smaller rejection region, like so. This rejection region may only take up the bottom 5% of the distribution. Finally, suppose you have to really minimise the occurrence of a type 1 error with Sam. He's a very sensitive character, and if he's accused of something he didn't do, he'll go off the rails and probably injure you severely. In this case, perhaps you should use a smaller rejection region, to minimise the chance of getting beat up. You should probably also reconsider who you hang out with. This smaller rejection region may take up only 1% of the area underneath the curve. So the size of the rejection region is determined by the person conducting the test. Let's delve into this concept a little further. So exactly what do we mean by rejecting H0 when it is in fact true? Well, in most modern legal system, we assume the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. In this case, the null hypothesis is that the defendant is innocent until proven otherwise. It is up to the prosecution to gather enough evidence in order to reject the null hypothesis. Sound familiar? All those hours spent watching Law & Order actually helps your statistics. And so did those hours watching daytime television. Remember Judge Judy? She was awesome. Now, imagine you're Judge Judy, and the defendant is accused of parking illegally on university campus. He denies parking there illegally and swears to God it was not him. However, there are two witnesses who swear they saw him park illegally. If found guilty, the defendant will be fined $100. Okay, so this is a pretty minor case. You could probably sort this out before the first commercial break. Okay. Let's picture another scenario. Again, imagine your Judge Judy. We'll call this scenario 2. The, f the defendant is accused of murdering his wife in cold blood. He denies the charge and swears to God it was not him who killed her. However, there are two witnesses who swear they saw him murder his wife. If found guilty, the defendant will spend the rest of his life in prison. Now, this is a pretty serious case here. So the question is, if you were Judge Judy, which of these two scenarios would keep you up at night? Let's take a look at what the type 1 error is in each case. In the first scenario, the type 1 error is when the defendant is actually innocent, yet has to pay a $100 fine. Now, this is not really a big deal. You may still be able to sleep well at night. Yes, it's still an injustice, but the consequence is relatively minor. In the second scenario, the type 1 error is that the defendant is innocent of murder, yet has to spend the rest of his life in prison. If you're Judge Judy, this decision will keep you up at night. Because if you mistakenly sentence an innocent man to a life in prison, then that's a huge injustice. That's why we see a different level of evidence required across civil and criminal cases. In a civil suit, the prosecution needs enough evidence based upon the balance of probability. This is because the type 1 error in civil suits aren't as harsh as in a criminal case. In a criminal case, however, the prosecution needs to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. So you can see that more evidence is required before rejecting the assumption of innocence. What we see here are different sizes of the rejection region. The significance level is simply the probability of committing a type 1 error. 
that is, it is the size of the rejection region. As we said earlier, the researcher determines the probability of a type 1 error he or she is comfortable with. So it's the researcher that sets the significance level of a test. It's denoted by alpha and will usually be given to you in the question as an input. Okay, now you may be wondering, how about the probability of a type 2 error? Well, calculating the probability of a type 2 error is beyond the scope of today's lecture. It will be covered in the next lecture on hypothesis testing. Alright, so, so far we've talked a lot about the null and alternate hypotheses, rejection regions and significance levels. There's one more piece to the puzzle. How do we figure out the cutoff values for the rejection regions? Because in the examples we've used so far, I've plucked those values out of thin air for the sake of simplicity. For example, if Sam scores below 120, we'll call him a liar. If he scores above 120, you'll believe his claim. But how did we arrive at this cutoff value of 120? That is, how do we calculate the critical value? I think the best way to learn this and put everything together is to walk through a few examples until it clicks. So let's go. This is the exam question version of our bowling example with Sam. Sam claims that his bowling average is at least 150. You play 30 games with him over the year and calculate his sample average to be 120. The population standard deviation of his bowling scores is 10, should you believe Sam. Use a significance level of 5%. Alrighty, notice how we've given you some more information and parameters in the question. This is how an exam question is likely to be set out. Pop quiz. Why don't we use a significance level of 0%? Recall that the significance level denotes the probability of a type 1 error. So doesn't the significance level of 0% mean there is no chance of a type 1 error? Isn't that a good thing? Unfortunately, using a significance level of 0% is a bad idea, because this would mean there is no rejection region, so we would never reject the null hypothesis. Obviously, it's a useless test if we only always have the same outcome not rejecting the null hypothesis. Anyway, back to the question. Alright, we're going to break down our work into little steps. Now, the first step is to figure out the null and alternate hypotheses and write them down in the correct format. Okay, so let's figure this out again. Sam claims that his true bowling average is equal to 150 or higher, so it looks like this. The counterclaim is the opposite of that. So the opposite of Sam's claim is that his true bowling average is below 150. That is, he's lying to us. Now, we know that the claim with the equal sign is a null hypothesis, and the other claim without the equal sign must be the alternate hypothesis. So we write it down in the proper format, with h0 on top of h1. You can also replace a less than or equal sign in the null hypothesis with an equal sign. This is fine too. Step two is fairly straightforward. We simply have to write down everything we know from the question at hand. First, what does the assumed population mean? Well, Sam claims that his true population mean and bowling scores is 150. Second, we play 30 games with him, which is only a sample of games, and calculate his sample average bowling score to be 120. Okay, we're also told that we play 30 games with Sam, so the sample size, n, is equal to 30. We're also told that the standard deviation in Sam's bowling scores is 10. Note that this is a true population standard deviation, so we denote this with sigma. That is, if we could observe all of Sam's bowling scores and calculate the standard deviation, it would be 10. Finally, we're told to test this claim at the 5% significance level. So alpha is equal to 0.05. Pretty straightforward, huh? Okay, it's also useful to write down the distribution. Now, because we're talking about averages, we can assume the distribution is normal. I'll talk about this concept, the central limit theorem, in the next lecture. The syntax for writing this down is as follows. We're saying that the sample mean, x hat, follows a normal distribution. That's what the n refers to. The first parameter in the parentheses is the average of the sample mean, which is a population average, mu. The second term is the variance of the sample mean. So filling these values in, we get the following. x hat is expected to follow a normal distribution with a mean of 150 and a variance of 3.33. We have to be careful here. The variance of the sample mean is not simply sigma squared, which is 100. That would be the variance for individual bowling scores, 
Since we're dealing with a sample average, the variance is sigma squared divided by n. I'll talk about this, otherwise known as a standard error, later in the lecture. Step 3 is drawing the distribution of the sample mean. We assume that the sample mean follows a normal distribution, so we first have to draw this. We assume the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. This means we can assume the population mean, or the average of the sample mean, is equal to 150. The next thing we need to do is to draw the rejection region. Recall that since this is a lower tailed test, because there is a less than sign in the alternate hypothesis, then the rejection region is on the left hand side of the distribution. Now, the important question here is, what is the cutoff for the rejection region? This is also referred to as a critical value. The significance level denotes the size of the rejection region. Since the significance level is 5%, then the size of the rejection region is 5% of the entire distribution. Figuring out the critical value is probably the hardest part of hypothesis testing. I'll show you guys how to use the z-tables, also known as the standard normal distribution tables, that are contained in the back of your textbook or provided by your course instructor. Okay, we'll stop here, and this concludes the first lecture of our series. Be sure to check out the second lecture of our hypothesis testing series, where you will learn how to completely answer a hypothesis testing question. Concepts covered in lecture 2 includes using the standard normal probability tables where I'll also talk about the intricacies and rules involved in using them effectively. Calculating the critical value, otherwise known as a cutoff value, to the rejection region. This is vital in answering the hypothesis testing question. How to calculate the z-score, otherwise referred to as a test statistic. This tells us whether the sample mean lies in the rejection region or not. How to formally make a decision or inference about the null and alternate hypotheses. We'll also work through three detailed examples, showing you how to answer typical exam questions in a step-by-step -step fashion, provide you with hints and tips along the way, and finally, I'll provide you with a detailed summary of what we've covered in lectures one and two to wrap up. Thanks for listening to today's lecture and subscribing to Quant Concepts Education. Hi guys, thanks for checking out my first lecture. I hope you found it helpful. There's so much more to cover in this topic, which I'll go through in lectures two and three. The material in Lecture 2 will allow you to complete an exam level question from start to finish. Lecture 3 covers key concepts in hypothesis testing, such as p-values, answering different type of hypothesis testing questions, student t-distributions, the central limit theorem, and so much more. So for less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can have a complete and thorough understanding of hypothesis testing. Check out the description below for details, and good luck with your studies.